accountability just because just because somebody is giving money and somebody is receiving the money and these are the kind of values that we are looking at as we move forward in catalyst 2030 and particularly in the community led development and uh, what does this essentially mean is it's moving from consulting communities to involving communities to now putting people and the planet at the center it's about shifting power money and agency it is about making the systems work for the most poor and marginal. And we have several examples at sector level, including HIV, which Frederick and me have been exchanging notes about, which has shown how putting communities at the center has been one of the major reasons for success, particularly in countries like India, where the, the response to the HIV epidemic has been one of the best. Right. With this, I would like to now, um, you know, bring my three co-facilitators, uh, you know, just to quickly introduce them and what they're going to be doing. Next slide, please. So Aaron uh, would uh, Aaron Schubert from uh, USAID, uh, Anand from Britspan, Frederick from True Footprint. Uh, gentlemen, if you can just take a minute each to talk about localization and what you do and what is your passion in that area, please. Aaron, over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Shiv. USAID is redoubling our commitment to shift more leadership and priority setting, project design, implementation and measuring results to the people and institutions with the capabilities and credibility to drive change in their own communities. Uh, to advance this localization, I'm personally championing effort here in India that will pursue three major lines of effort. The first one is locally led development, the process by which a diverse group of local actors set their own development agendas, develop and implement solutions, use their capabilities, leadership, and resources to promote equitable change, and ensure that positive outcomes can be sustained by local actors for local actors. We're also looking at local systems practice, the lens we use to understand development results and suggest interventions to achieve sustainability. Improving development and humanitarian results requires strengthening system performance by developing local capacities, deepening interrelationships among local actors, improving equity and aligning the incentives that shape the system. Finally, local capacity strengthening, a set of approaches that support local actors to achieve their mission, take actions to design and implement equitable responses to local challenges, learn and adapt and innovate and transform over time. Thanks, Shiv. Thank you, Aaron. Over to you, Anand. Thanks, Shiv. Um, so my name is Anand. Uh, and I think we should improve. Uh, so I, I, I guess we'll, we'll double down a little more around the why of measurement and, and two parts to that. Uh, clearly, this is not a new topic. Clearly, this is a topic which can get tokenistic very fast. So the question that we'll frame is, why not? Uh, imagine a for-profit world where you said, look, I have a global multinational and I'm trying to implement a product in India. Uh, how crazy would it be if it was not localized? Uh, you go back 30 years, you know, how Unilever actually got the products going in India compared to Proctor's. It was a localization story. Why is it that this sector is, you know, finding it hard to, you know, understand this point and frame it as a why not rather than a why? So that's going to be point one. I, and we're excited about this because, you know, with this, it can go to the next level of what do you measure? But also, I think importantly, what do you not measure? Localization without actually giving more degrees of freedom, uh, you know, is is going to be a false narrative. So what you stop measuring, and what what are the things you stop insisting on, so that you can give more power to the local. So in some ways, I think what are some of the false narratives? What are the choices which are the hard ones? And then what do we have to measure and stop measuring? Are the things which uh, are exciting, and, and we'll sort of double click into that. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Frederick, over to you. Dave, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this, right? We each had working groups that really are all about this agenda. And, uh, and, and this is why I've joined Catalyst as an opportunity to, to amplify and really bring a community, contribute to bring a community together around this. This is not a new agenda, as you said. So in my personal journey is that before True Footprint, I spent uh, 15 years working on community-driven accountability. Uh, 3,000 projects across the world, 
uh, in very difficult settings sometimes where people said it couldn't be done. And the only reason it worked so successfully was because it was entirely driven bottom up. It wasn't because yeah, donors, investors were on board necessarily. And I've translated that into the work at True Footprint now, which is about the decarbonization of value chains and, and where this again has to be done bottom up and to the true benefit of communities. Yes, corporations will benefit, the world will benefit, but it has to be foremost the communities at the base of value chains that benefit. Otherwise, nothing long term can be achieved. And and the excitement here is, yes, beyond the statement of the obvious, is how do we make this operational? How do we make this happen in such a way that it truly has impact, going beyond rhetoric to real action? Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's an honor and pleasure to work with the three moderators here. Uh, can I request uh, Flair, if you can go to slide number four? I skipped a slide and I want to go back there so that the audience and the participants get a very clear sense of the overall uh, one and a half hours. Slide four, which has the overview. My apologies for skipping this slide. All right, so uh, we are in the 14th minute. We will be breaking into uh, smaller uh, groups and uh, my co-moderators, you are going to be lucky to have 30 plus participants in your room. Uh, there's uh, nearing 100 attendees uh, who are here enthusiastically to participate. We will spend 40 minutes in three rooms. Room one is going to be led by Anand uh, on how do we aggregate learnings and evidence around localization. Room two will be led by Aaron, and that will be around how do we enable financing for localization. And number three group will be led by Frederick. It will be about how we promote localization through proximal leadership. And I know if I give you a chance, all of you would have loved to go to room number two, which is one of the important issues. So we're going to be democratically dividing all of you. Uh, I think Aparna has the uh, choice and the chance to put you all into a group. So as I say goodbye to all of you here in the plenary, we will be coming back here in the next 40 minutes to have a deep plenary discussion. And this is your opportunity in the smaller group to do the interactions. Thank you very much over to the co-moderators and the breakout rooms, please. Okay, Re no, read it. Um, hello, everyone. We'll just wait for the other attendees to join.
um aparna are you assigning rooms to the people who just joined or uh, they can just yes, but i was also looking for aaron who is apparently in the room but we're unable to see him uh so we're just checking on that please if you can just bear with us for a couple of minutes yes yeah, sure sure Jeru, do you want to um, go into any room? Everyone, hi. This is Florencia here. I hope you all can hear me. Yes. Yes, I have assigned you all the rooms. If you all could move into each room, that would be great. Okay. Just let me, in case you all can't or enter the rooms, I'll be happy to assign you all again to the rooms. Hi, Karansha. Is it possible to be assigned to breakout room one, please? Yes, right away. Okay, thank you so much. Hi, can I join the financing group, please? Yes. Thank you. Um, yes, I would, I would like to join group one, please. Yes. Group one.
Susanna, is there a specific room you'd like to be in? You're on mute. You're on mute. Thank you. No, I'll just wait here in the main room when the others come back. Thank so you. It's a 40 minute conversation. So it's going to be a bit while uh, till everyone comes back here. So is there any specific thing that you'd like to focus on? No, I think that's fine because I'll need to jump in and jump out. Oh, okay, Thank sure. You. Jiru, would you like to be in a specific room? Okay, I think that's... Uh, Indrani, you? Actually, Francia, I'll go to all the rooms and I'll just see the conversation because I'm part okay. of the logistics. Cool. Um, I think there is a request from somebody to change the room. Like I'm just going to tell you. Umang yeah. is, wants to go to breakout one. Can you help him? Umang, yes. Folks, I'm on two things. That's why I'm already in Shiv's room on my other device because I'm having problems. Oh, okay. 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 So don't bother to make me go anywhere. Sure. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, yeah? Jeru. Okay. Yeah. Karen, uh, is there a specific room that you'd like to be at? Yes, please. Thank you. Hello. Room three would be great. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. I think that should cover it. Uh, Indrani, I hope you can switch between rooms. I will. I will. So that I can just go and take some notes on the conversations just for kind of, you know, some tweets. Sounds good. Sounds yeah. good. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks.
Hey, Dradi, Jaruyo. Yes, just me. Yeah. yeah, hi. Yes, yes, I'm here. Hello? What happened? Valencia? Somebody was. Oh. Yeah, Jeru, were you saying something to me? Oops. Florencia, how long is left? Clarence, I'll just go into one of the rooms just to capture something. How long is there? I mean, how long the session is going to be? How much time is left?
what seems impossible is only a point of view. How we make it possible lies within me and you. It starts with opening our heart to a true sense of community, to celebrate its every moving part and serve our deep humanity. Driven by collaboration and vigor, we will bounce forward and how? Together with them, him and her. A new world resilience now. Hello everyone, uh, welcome back. Uh, I know some of you joined a little bit late and were moved straight into one of the breakout rooms. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I, we are going to be now um, taking a quick uh, quiz, a Mentimeter. You will see a QR code there. If you can just take your phones and flash it on the QR code, or you can go directly to menti.com and enter your code. We would like to hear what's on your mind post the breakout session. Just one word. Okay, do we have the results? Yes, wonderful. I hope all of you are able to see the, the wonderful list of things people are putting down and possibility seems to be the most important one along with inclusion, hopefulness. Inclusion, agility, negotiation, shift the power. Fantastic. Uh, now we will move to listening from the three groups. Uh, can I invite uh, group one led by Anand to share uh, uh, or rather debrief all of us on the, uh, on the discussions in group one, just to clarify to a few of you from the international audience, FCRA stands for Foreign Currency Regulation Act in India, which is one of those acts which have uh, limited uh, civil society participation significantly, particularly smaller ones. So in case you were wondering, what does FCRA stand for? Anand, over to you for a quick uh, debrief in five minutes, please. Sure, thank you, Shiv. Uh, and thanks to my exceptional uh, breakout uh, group. Uh, we, 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 I think, uh, covered a few areas. I think we started by the question on why does uh, the evidence part feel so hard? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it, it was... Uh, it was interesting to hear from Pankaj uh, and, and Dr. Vamiyu around uh, sometimes what seems like evidence or measurement actually is a symptom of a misaligned priority. Uh, and uh, it just plays out, you know, in the evidence uh, side of things. So, so I think one, one big takeaway was if one is not investing time and also building deep trust between the funder and the program, uh, designer and implementer. And if a true negotiation is not happening, uh, it's going to be very hard to measure this well. Uh, and there are examples which were discussed on where that has happened. I think the second thing which came through was uh, the whole topic on mindsets. Uh, it's so easy to 
uh, expect you know all the compliance to happen. It's so easy to expect a certain format to be filled. Uh, it's harder to say, I don't know, I need to learn from you. It's even harder if the program officer is 30 years old and working with a nonprofit who actually, you know, like the power dynamics are imbalanced. So how, how does this mindset get addressed? Uh, I think the third thing was, how do we collectively do, maybe it's codification, maybe it's already there, if not put it in place to establish beyond any drought, doubt that localized impact is far, far higher than programs which are not localized, almost to the point that it ceases to be a topic of conversation. Uh, we discussed an interesting point on how does this intersect with SDGs? Uh, there's a lot of funding, there's a lot of funder focus on SDGs. SDGs are by definition quite focused on a certain pillar, whereas localized you know, programs or localized organizations think holistically. That's the way communities work. How, does, how do these two things marry? And, and you know, if we don't do that proactively, it could very well be that funders who are very SDG focused find it very hard to actually connect here. So is there an evidence to connect the two? And I think the last point uh, which came through, Arvind also made that, is how do we codify learnings? Uh, Catalyst uh, already has 70 such maybe global best practices, but are there another thousand? How do these get codified? How do these get open source? So one doesn't need to find example, uh, find it difficult to find these examples. Uh, so these were maybe five areas and uh, it seemed like there are many of these which can be immediate action points as well. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. That was a fantastic summary of a fairly rich discussion. And I think Ria in your group has also helped capture some of them in a slide deck. So we will leave it to the audience for now. And uh, thank you so much. Can I turn to Aaron? Aaron? Uh, on financing, uh, room number two, your debrief, please. Uh, thanks so much, Shiv. We had a, a great conversation and, and wide participation. So thanks everybody that was uh, willing to speak out on the call. There is a broad feeling that large donors are most interested in numbers. And sometimes the they're unrealistic in terms of their expectations and timeline and, and, and what might must be achieved by local partners and then tying continued funding to kind of over ambitious targets and goals. And there is a consensus for a need for a more bottom up approach to uh, all of the development work that we're doing to make sure that um, the government and other stakeholders are, are not implementing something that's top down and how we can make sure that um, the solutions are really derived by the people who um, seek them not by an external force. We are we seek continued knowledge sharing with the communities up front um, at the time of commencement of projects to collectively address the framing of local issues on financing. Um, we also talked about how we advocate better for communities to enable financing and how do we close that gap um, between the communities and the donors once we're convinced that a community-driven approach is the most effective. Um, we also talked about cultural differences between countries and nature of problems and that donor expectations from one organization are very high and that sustainable change requires three to five years, perhaps in some cases decades. Uh, some persons, uh, you know, someone specifically mentioned, I've been working for 20 years on, uh, on a development challenge and the solution, you know, is still um, we're still working on it and so it's unrealistic for a donor to come in and say okay here's five years of funding and then we'll close down and and the the solution or the issue will be addressed we also talked about regulatory restrictions like fcra or ficra in india um, as a potential bottleneck or serious barrier for cso's and ngos and um, how we can explore other avenues such as an exemption in collaboration with the government to kind of open up and allow that flow again from donors down to uh, local organizations. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to you, Shiv, thanks. Thank you, thank you so much, Aaron. That was a quick, real good summary of what happened in room two. We go to room three, Frederick, over to you on proximal leadership. Thank you so much, Shiv. Yeah, and at, at one level, yeah, local leadership may seem like an, an obvious category, right? That it doesn't require elaboration. 
because localization requires working with local leaders. But as we unpack it and, uh, and look at what lessons have been learned along the way, experiences people have had. So we were privileged to have in the meeting in our breakout, Dr. Sundar Sundararam and, uh, and, um, and his experience from many decades of working on health and Shama Karkal from, of course, from Swasti also working on public health. And I think global public health has some of the richest experiences related to localization, well ahead of work on the humanitarian sector, well ahead of much other development work. And, and, and as you said in the opening remarks, where things have gone well, localization and proximate leadership have played essential roles in that. It's, it's inextricably linked. And, but so the, the question Dr. Sundar was highlighting is, is what does that really involve? And so one thing is simply language, right? Not everyone has access to English, which is the dominant language of international development by far. And, and it may even be a certain kind of English that's expected. Uh, so that's one thing. And then about the networks and the, the building of relationships. And Shama highlighted also the necessity of proximate leadership, not just at the frontline organizations where it is in a sense obvious, but right through the system, that it really needs to go from local to national to funding to global. Uh, that that is key to that. And, and yes, that's also, I guess, been a, an experience from global public health. So I think we have a lot to learn there. Anushka uh, Siddiqui from Birdspan shared uh, some of the analysis that they have done. And, uh, and, and we have a long way to go is the conclusion from that. Uh, and, and that relates to research done both in India, but also in Africa. And where, if I got it correctly, even African philanthropists are not privileging African uh, implementing organizations. So uh, e even there, Dr. Wamuyu, there is really work to be done to, to make that happen even in Africa. Uh, this is a category that can lend itself to be done badly as well, where it can be tokenistic, where it can simply be a, rep a continuation of practices, is simply through greater inclusion and representation, simply a continuation of practices that have been there before. And, and so key to this is really where the power lies and is in the nature of funding, which Anushka also highlighted, much more trust-based funding, far more open funding, and truly allowing leaders to lead simply, right? Otherwise, it is tokenistic. Thank you, Shiv. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you. Uh, I, you you're gifted to have uh, Dr. Sundar, one of my mentors in your group. Uh, and he usually uh, reminds all of us there's a big difference between organizing and organization, right? And similarly, did your group talk about the difference between leaders and leadership? Uh, did that come up, Frederick? Well, I think that was implied very much there. And uh... And, and just another, since you give me the occasion, another issue that was brought up was actually safeguarding for local leaders, right? Mm -hmm. Once these emerge, actually some of them will be at risk. And we have seen that in mm -hmm. many places. So it's not just obvious to highlight leadership also means actually making sure that they are safe in doing so. Fantastic, fantastic. Adam, a quick question for you. Could your group identify, I mean, you know, we're, we're privileged to for USAID to commit uh, you know, uh, publicly to a certain percentage of your funding to go to local organizations. How do we make other donors uh, make similar commitments and uh, actually move the needle in this area? Is there anything that you are taking away from from all the conversations from there? I think that's a great question for me to take forward. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, we have committed twenty five percent of all funding globally to go to local partners, but. Uh, that's not enough in some countries. I was previously working in South Africa and we achieved 73% of our funding in South Africa went to local partners. Um, in India, it's at 25%, but I think actually that's, it should be double or triple that amount given the context of local organizations that exist within India. So I think internally, USAID has a lot more work to do on localization, but also at a higher level, um, reaching donor consensus that uh, we must all uh, set ourselves and hold ourselves accountable to a large, larger percentage of funding going to local organizations. And then, you know, 
the U.S. also contributes to Global Fund and other things like that, and asking Global Fund also to do the same. Um, and then, but I think um, it can't stop there too. We have to really share those best practices. Uh, if, if we have successes in South Africa, for example, of achieving 73%, how can we take those forward in other countries? And what kind of models did we use to get that far? Um, and how can we uh, scale those up as well? Super, super. Uh, this part of the program, uh, anybody uh, in the audience, if you'd like to ask a question or make a point, please use the virtual hand. I want to turn to Anant meanwhile. Anant, uh, the point about Global Fund, right? Uh, and uh, Frederick made a comment in one of our earlier sessions that Global Fund is one of those which actually moved a large sum. Frederick, am I right, around $50 billion for HIV, TB, and malaria? and sought to work with proximal organizations, right? But the instruments used, the kind of evidence which was required, the accountability measures which were required, almost made it impossible for smaller organizations to participate, right? And unless there, are, uh, there were layers of organizations which had to be built up. Is there anything that we can do from the evidence point of view, not just collecting, but can the, is there some evidence to make the pipeline more lighter and meaningful rather than making it very heavy. So well, thanks, Shilvan. I think some of this is, um, you know, work in progress, as you can imagine. But I think the way I think about this is, you know, rather than thinking of, you know, upfront, get all the evidence, rather thinking it about like a pipeline or a journey. Um, and and uh, an interesting example is how startups today in India think about customer onboarding. You know, they are the banks in the earlier world and banks are a great example of like very hard to deal with organizations, the big banks. They used to ask for a 30 page form upfront, which kept bulk of Indians out of the game. Today, when you work with a fintech company on an app, you have three questions and you get started. And as you go along, so it's, it's basically saying, you know, get started, minimize the amount of evidence needed to be on the journey and assume people are honest and people are good unless proven otherwise, rather than, you know, assuming everyone is actually out to cheat us and, you know, like ask for mountains of evidence. I, I guess, you know, this, this is lots to learn from the startup world simply because they have been forced to do this and, and maybe there could be some parallels there. And of course, in evidence, this might be sacrilege, but if one answers the question, what is the minimum viable evidence rather than the maximum viable evidence, uh, maximum possible evidence, that may be an interesting way to think about it. Uh, thanks, Jim. No, thank you. Thank you. I, I also wondered whether any nomenclatures came up as one of the uh, issues. For example, uh, we call uh, you know, people as uh, frontline workers. The word workers is used, right? That means they're supposed to be doing somebody's work. Uh, they're not catalysts. They're not the people interacting with communities. They're not the people who are researchers, uh, who are the people who cure, who look after people, right? But that's not the terminology. We give this word called workers. Does it really matter what we call these, uh, you know, frontline workers or the community leaders? Does it matter that what word we use? Anybody has a thought on that? And I have a quick reaction to that. Uh, and again, you know, uh, this 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 started a little bit uh, personally. I think the change mm -hmm. from workers to owners usually has a huge impact on, on, because owners define the metrics, owners hold the power, workers don't hold the power. So in some ways, I think if we truly, but this has to not be tokenistic. So I think along with the change in the designation, um, I mean, a great example is Amul, right? Now, again, it's a complex situation, but how do we actually change the power dynamics on, on nomenclature? But then it cannot be a situation where it's a puppet and string situation where you know, we're calling them owners, but then, you know, like all the checks and balances are coming from behind. So uh, it, it could be powerful that way, Shiv, uh, some thoughts. Absolutely, absolutely. This is an open session, folks. Please raise your virtual hand. Naga, did I see your hand up? Please come in and then followed by Alan. Yes. No, um, I, I think I was, the, Anand did cover a bit of it, but, but I think more than changing the designation, it's, I think, uh, just, just, when when we sort of design people's roles now whether it you know, whether it is it that of a facilitator or a worker and i think uh, giving more importance to that as in uh, how do we 
how much value do we look at somebody who is very close to the problem, who is able to talk about it through lived experience? And is that only an anecdote to a solution or are they an active part of uh, actively trying to solve it? So I think uh, that thought process definitely needs a shift. We most often tend to look at this as a discussion, as an input, um, and, and then it's not a they're not a dynamic part of the process. So so I think and that's where maybe the gap starts starts to widen in a sense. Right. right. Thank you. Adam? I think that too, um, we need to look at some of the factors that facilitated the growth of large international NGOs and their ability to rapidly expand and finding the balance of what lessons can we learn from them to grow and expand local organizations without destroying the, the organization in a, of itself. And I think that, for example, networks, uh, international organizations hold trainings on how to work with, how to receive money from uh, large donors, how to um, basically ensure regulatory requirements are met and how do we tap into those or create a separate network for local organizations to learn and to share experiences with each other? Um, I think another interesting thing is the overhead a lot of, of a lot of these large organizations is 34%. And most local organizations do not aim to get such a huge chunk of overhead. So how do we help them to do that? For, because that enables them to buy their office and to make much longer term investments to help that local organization survive when that pot of funding may drive up. When, when, may drive up. But most local organizations that I have worked with go very low and ask for a very low overhead um, and they never think about buying their office or making some of those sustainable investments. So how do we really kind of take some of those uh, factors that large uh, organizations have done and leverage them for negotiations for a local organization to kind of get a bigger piece of the pie to then invest in capacity development of their staff, to invest in their um, finance systems, to invest in their HR, uh, to make them a stronger organization. But I think I've encountered many that are afraid to do that. Uh, so that's too much money. We want to put all of our money into programs. But to, to look a little bit bigger um, on sustaining the ability of their organization to continue. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. I uh, really want to thank everyone who switched on their video. Can I request others not to feel shy? It's okay if your background is uh, a little bit complicated for explaining or if your child is running around, it doesn't matter. Keep your video on if you can, please. That would be wonderful. Riti, over to you after the show. Thank you, Shiv. I just want to, Aaron's point, just wanted to build on that. I think one example we are seeing in Africa um, is uh, Adesso's work on building Core and Kuja Link. So Core is a platform where a lot of local organizations are enlisted to help make it easier for funders to identify them and source sort of channel money and funding to uh, local and proximate organizations. And Kuja Link is a shared services platform that helps many local and proximate organizations build their HR, strengthen their OD, uh, so which points to all the points, Aaron, you spoke about. So the small example just wanted to add that. Thank you. That's excellent with you. That, that addresses the point which, uh, uh, which was made by Aaron about, you know, how do you get the advantages of a large INGO kind of uh, organization? I think, uh, you know, Catalyst 2030 itself is a great platform where we should think about things like this. But Aaron, I want to throw that point back at you for the contra point that the INGO format of, you know, turnover increasing every year on year, getting more projects, hiring more people, is that the only paradigm of growth? Or should there be another paradigm where you actually scale deep rather than just have many, many projects? Just a thought uh, while I bring in Shama uh, into the conversation. Um, thank you, Shiv, and thank you for the, uh, you know, in, insightful conversations. I just wanted to respond on a point that you had made earlier, and this was something that we were discussing in room three, uh, organizing organization uh, leadership versus leader, right? And I, and I think when we are talking about proximate leadership, we want a variety and we want also leadership outside of what is traditional institutional forms. Uh, and, and I think that color is very, very important. And, and that is 
to me, I think one of the reasons why we don't see enough of leadership or enough space for leadership, I think we don't accept informal groups, coalitions, um, you know, forums that allow for expression of leadership, decision-making action. And increasingly those are coming about, right? If you take in an urban Indian context, you have ward level committees, which you know, today are just citizens coming together. They actually have budgets, people will change, but they take decisions which are for their ward, right? We've seen even something like community led monitoring, which is a monitoring process, bringing in, apologies, bringing in a variety of different people to come into monitoring service delivery and taking decisions. Now, all of these, there is no institution there. There's no organization per se, but there is expression of leadership and decision making. And there will be funding that's required. There will be facilitators required, uh, but that's not necessarily in that. And I think how do we create space for much more of that uh, is, is really something that we should be looking at. Right. I, I think creating the spaces, the platforms, and I think Sundar had a very good point. Uh, Jero, this is an interesting idea which has come from this group, is that we should have a proximal leaders uh, conclave, you know, for them to get together and uh, share lessons uh, in, their, in their language and in their, uh, you know, respective domains and geographies. I think that's something we should take it upon Catalyst 2030 is one of the action points. Tim, good to have you here. You mentioned, uh, you know, the word decolonization has not been used. Uh, do you want to come in and uh, share your perspective? And I recently heard from a donor a very interesting perspective around uh, decolonization. Over to you, Tim. Yeah, thank you, Shiv. Uh, I just I just mentioned it because I I uh, and, and noting that the term doesn't always land well <laughs> with all donors because perhaps it's overly provocative or painful or touches on colonist fragility. Um, but I think it is a very important frame for us to, to understand um, um, this broader point as to why is so little of the funding actually getting to, to proximate actors. Um, why, yeah, so it's, Again, I, I recognize that uh, that it will it'll shut down a lot of donors just using it because it's overly provocative. But I think we need to continue using it and talking about it be, until it becomes um, more mainstream. Until we start using this framing uh, as uh, particularly for global north, north donors, um, and I'm not talking just about public sector donors either. I'm talking about private sector donors because we have to look at this in the realm of, of the history of, of colonization. And if we just look at it as an efficacy issue, that is, um, and not as a broader social justice issue, we miss out on a big part of, of the conversation. Absolutely, Tim, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, on the chat window, I have uh, shared a link to the shifting uh, funding practices, which is something Catalyst 2030 Network has been pushing for. Uh, Jeru, uh, how many signatures do we have currently? I don't want to give the wrong figure. Is it 10,000 plus? Um, Jeru, can you help me? I can hear you, yeah. Uh, probably yeah. I can see. But I'm on another session, so go and see. Okay, so around 10,000 signatures, and uh, Tim, some of those issues that you mentioned are raised, you know, more in a positive way. What do we want donors to do rather than not only labeling them. But Tim, here's something extremely interesting. Uh, the Packard team in India told me, decolonization is not just a global North versus global South issue. It's also decolonization from Delhi to Bihar. And it's from in Bihar, from Patna to uh, you know, a province, right? The, it's the mentality. It is the mindset that we are talking about when we're talking about colonization. Uh, and, and therefore, it is important to talk about it. I completely agree with you, it's provocative. Uh, but but it's also important to make the shift, right? Uh, Deepak and then Frederick. Yeah, just to want to add to your point, Shiv, it's not just from Delhi to Bihar, but also about uh, gender, about caste, about tribes in Africa, you know, all those things. It's, it can be within the same office as well. It has hideous forms. Uh, I completely agree with you, Deepak. Thank you. Frederick. I was simply agreeing. <laughs> Thumbs up, was all. Thank you. Thumbs up. Okay. Okay. Jeru, you, you had a hand up. 
Sorry, I was just wondering, I know we have only four minutes, but can someone address the big concern of INGOs just reinventing themselves and staying once again in the same space and not really there for having fun flows go to community organizations and proximate leaders? I've heard everyone skirt around, but I think that's really one of the big problems we need to tackle. So how can we do that? Jill, I would put that very, very firmly in the hands of donors who fund the NGOs, because they have the power to change it more than the NGOs, in my view. But that's that's only one of the solutions. I agree. But in fact, uh, that's a good call out, Jill. We have four minutes. We're going to have the last of the question for you. Uh, get your phone ready, or you know, be be on to menti.com. My colleague is going to ask you, because Catalyzing Change Week is about action. And after this one and a half hour conversation that you invested your time on, we would like to hear from you, what is that one thing you're gonna be doing as, as an individual or as, as an organization or as a network? What's that one thing you plan to invest in based on these conversations? Uh, Flair, thank you. What's the action that you're committing, particularly relating to localization? While we are getting the comments on, uh, I just want to turn back to my three colleagues, uh, Aaron, Anant, and Frederick. Uh, any last comments from your side, Aaron? Thanks. I, I think that my last comment would be this cannot be once off, that the dialogue and exchange uh, must continue in a concerted effort in order for those best practices um, and kind of holding each other accountable for this drive towards localization to continue. And just on your last point, I, I put in the in the survey, uh, NGOs or donors can restrict competition to local partners only. So USAID has tremendous power just to say, well, this competition is only open to local partners. And then it, it makes, in terms of addressing the comment about INGOs just reinventing themselves, uh, you would be shocked by some of the proposals we receive where a local partner then has a sub partner that is an INGO, um, you know, and that INGO clearly approached the local partner and said, oh, we'll write the grant for you or we'll do everything and then you just give the funding to us. But right. uh, the donor can make that decision up front and say no, you can't. So I think um, for everybody on the call, that's just a question that you should pose to the donors whenever you meet with them. Why are you making us compete with these organizations that are you know, oftentimes based in another country or may not be familiar with the context? And can you please consider limiting competition to local organizations only? Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. And uh, 20 seconds. Yeah, maybe maybe an uh, interesting building on Aaron's point. A call to action could be, what do we choose not to measure? And what do we choose to measure? And how do we choose to measure? So rather than this being a free for all where you know there's a lot of chaos which is created can some of these best practices be put out there and that starts becoming the norm uh, and catalyst could actually take the lead in that thank you and frederick last word what it makes me think is really 2030 right and already a lot is happening but one thing is can everyone hear uh, frederick no frederick you're breaking uh, sorry frederick you're breaking up uh, i want to bring in my colleague shama who's uh, been here uh, through this journey with me for several years shama your final thoughts 
I think collaborative action, I think especially for local organizations working with each other and for organizations uh, who are larger have the relationships to actually make sure that uh, the local organizations, local communities are actually uh, supported in all forms, whether it's leadership, funding, uh, and everything else. I think very, very important for us to be able to do that. Okay, thank you. Frederick, are you back? Uh, we lost you in between. I am back. Well, yeah, well thank you. No, somehow the internet had a wobble. Uh, I, I was saying the, the role of Catalyst 2030 here as a catalyst mm -hmm. for this change, I think is an incredible opportunity for us. And I just highlight a couple of things. One is the capacity development and the network of networks. The third, the second is in terms of creating opportunities for collective uh, 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 proposals. And the third is really putting uh, the accountability to the communities we're serving. If we can get some of these things right, we can disrupt this sector. So it can be a phenomenal opportunity to do this thing, which is, as one of your questions said, is old wine in a new bottle in a certain sense, but we have the opportunity to do it very differently. Thank you, Frederick. And that's the kind of a hopeful note I would like to close the session. Thank you very much. Uh, there's close to 70 to 100 people who are in this conversation. You all are absolutely passionate about this issue. Thank you for joining. And uh, as part of the output of the Catalyzing Change Week, you will find a report coming out uh, containing all these points. Thank you very much. And uh, fight on. This is an important issue. We all have a different role to play. And we also have a joint role. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know. If I can request the facilitators to stay on, please. Frederick, Shama, Eric. Anand. What an amazing job you did in convening this. And thanks for all the preparation you put in. Oh, uh, a huge thanks to Aparna, who did uh, pretty much the heavy well, lifting. Aparna, Aparna did a lot of heavy lifting. Yeah, big uh, thanks. Not more than one session. <laughs> really? She's heavy, She's heavy yeah. lifting on three, I think. <laughs> so, yes. Oh, my God. So, I Frederick, I think uh, the Catalyst group probably had how many, Shaman? Six CCW sessions? 